Hi, it's time for a vintage unboxing video. So what do we have today? We have an old, old cardboard box. And if we flip it over, what you'll see, it's got a music and sound intercom in it. This is a music and sound model MS300B. It's called the Final Kit. In this carton, according to the box, it contains one master station unit with back can, four intercom music speakers with grills, one door speaker unit with grill that's metal, one ivory faceplate with phono jacks, four speaker control knobs, plus miscellaneous screws, nuts, and washers. Music and sound incorporated. Apparently it's called the Twinette. And this is, I believe, from around 1957. And I also believe that it is the very first music and sound intercom ever made, or the very first model, not the very first one. This is back when Music and Sound was still at 118 Leslie Street in Dallas, Texas, zip code seven. I bought this recently from a fella that had it for sale on eBay. He was actually located in Canada, and how it made its way to Canada, I don't know. We have a shipping label on here, of Music and Sound Incorporated. It went to some business called Intrasound at 421 Plainfield in Springfield, Massachusetts. They don't exist anymore apparently. However, I did Google map the address. It's what's in a, looks like a fairly regular sort of old town residential neighborhood. Apparently, Intrasound probably was a fella who did intercom systems or something and maybe worked out of his house. I don't know. The other thing that's interesting about the box is on this end, which might be a little hard to see, we have an American Airlines Incorporated air shipment label. It's a little hard to read because it was like stamped on the box, but we have an air bill number, which is 01 DAC or L 054750 and some scribbling numbers you can't read. Final something destination was BAF. Don't know where BAF is. Looks like a lot number and can't really read the rest of it. It's all kind of uh, washed out. Why was it shipped on American Airlines? I don't know. How did it end up in Canada? I don't know that either. Maybe it went to Intrasound in Massachusetts and they sold it to someone in Canada. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, this is supposed to be new old stock and complete, and it probably is. So let's go ahead and open it up and see what we got. Now, of course, we're not really big on music and sound stuff around here because we do new tone stuff. But every now and then, something really cool comes along, and you just got to have it, you know? This could possibly be the very last music and sound model. What's the model again? MS300B Twinette on the planet, if it really is new old stock. So we have intercommunication and high fidelity music systems by Music and Sound. And here we have essentially their catalog. Let's see if there's a date on this. No, it's catalog number MS5. So perhaps it's the second one that they made. Here's a high fidelity MS500C music system. It looks like it's an AM FM tuner. Not sure what that's about. I don't know a lot about this really early music and sound stuff. Apparently there were two models here in the catalog. We have a companion model, which is an MS400 and the Twinette model, which is an MS300. So it looks like they're both AM radio. I'm not sure what the difference is exactly. I'm just sort of scanning through the technical data, which they give here, and it looks very similar. I think one of the differences looks like the room speakers for the 400 have two knobs on them, and the room speakers for the 300 have a single knob. So I'll have to study this a little bit more because like I said, I don't really know a lot about this. And I didn't do any research much on this because there isn't much research to do on this. Really couldn't find very much. Here we have some old newspapers. This is the Dallas Times Herald from March 27, 1957. So apparently, Somebody packed it this way. Here's an ad for Nemus, Neiman Marcus. That's interesting. We'll look at that. 
And here we have on the top a bunch of crusty knobs. I think those are for the remote speakers. And we've got some what look like to be about five inch diameter speaker cones on the back. It says Viking 220704. And over here it says 4J6V1400. And little wires soldered onto the terminal strip. And if we carefully unfold the really yellow newspaper, gotta love the packaging. We've got a open control switch with some wires attached to it. And I suppose this is the way this was packaged at the factory. No date on this one, or maybe there is. No. But apparently in 1957, you could buy a sailcloth sports set, which is what looks like women's clothing, for Mrs. Sizes 10 to 20 for $3.88. That's probably a good price. Is that like going to Old Navy nowadays? So there's another one. And another one. And another one. These are actually in pretty good shape. The cardboard surround on this one's a little mangled, but it's not too bad. And another one here. So I assume that if it's like most 50s intercoms, inside stations, door stations, fundamentally the same. There's a rock washer, fell off one of those probably. There's a nut. All right, let's get rid of the styrofoam peanuts and see what we got. Got to try to keep the shop cleaned up. All right, get rid of those cardboard. Some more peanuts. And here we have wrapped up in paper towels, which I'm sure are modern. We have grills. Sort of a, they're metal. I think they're metal. Let's do the uh, magnet test. Now, if they're metal, the magnet will stick. And it doesn't, so I don't think they are. Maybe they're, maybe they could be some kind of like fiberglassy kind of material or some kind of early plastic. The cloth grill is glued on to the back. You can see they were very generous with the glue. And this corner is cut off at a diagonal here because that's where the volume control mounts through. So I imagine that somehow these sit here and the control goes through there. Something like that. So there seems to be Five grills, another knob, got these kind of funky, they look like they're Bakelite, acorn shaped control knobs with little set screws in them. So you've got, there's no metal insert, it's just threaded through the Bakelite. But what one of the things that a lot of people don't know is Bakelite is a preferred material for something like this as opposed to plastic because the screw generally won't strip out the Bakelite unless you really wrench on it. More cardboard. And then down inside, we've got the Twinette. Now down in the bottom, there's a bunch of shredded newspaper. Probably also all from 1957. It's got these cardboard corners which means somebody came up with a packaging plan for this. Uh, here we have a pack of screws, nuts, washers to fasten speakers to grill, one inch screws to fashion grill to wall. And here we have phono faceplate with jack. I have to look through this, make sure we don't leave anything out, but I think that's everything that's in the box. 
put this down here. And here we have our Twinette in its plastic bag, which is probably original. Got the remnants of a rubber band around the knob and some kind of little cap, which I don't readily see where it goes. But, there it is. And, it's in pretty good shape. And here's our model MS300B Twinette. It has a copper toned finish. It's painted, it's not anodized. I think we really need to get this rubber band remnant off of here. I would imagine that it had maybe a booklet or something that doesn't readily want to come off. So I guess we'll just leave it for now. It looks like we've got an cl analog clock here. Analog means it has hands. And it also looks like it's got some extra controls. This knob says alarm set. And the top one says on, radio, auto, and off. So I have a feeling that's the power switch perhaps. Here we have, says sleep set, and it looks like zero to 90 minutes perhaps. And here's time set, and if you pull it out, you can set the clock. It does have a second hand. And if you pull out this one, probably, or not, maybe just turn it, it moves the red hand, and that's your alarm set. So maybe it's designed so you can program it like a clock radio and it turns on at a certain time every day. Up here we've got what I assume are room control switches, one through six, and this last one is labeled as M, which I assume is the master station. And these are the types that you push in and out and in and out. This one seems to be stuck in. So these are probably, I was, I'm gonna guess that the way you use this is, unless these are all broken, is when you want to use the intercom, you push and hold it down and then use the control down here or something. I don't know, up to the, if there's instructions, we'll have to see what it says. It's a AM only and this is your AM tuning dial. And it seems as if the numbers on the dial don't line up with how much it rotates. Right now it's at about 1200 and it should continue to turn counterclockwise, but it won't. But if we turn it clockwise, we're into an area with no numbers. So I'm gonna guess that at some point this was taken off and not put back on correctly. So I think if we do it like that, that gets us more back in the range of where we should be. One of the things right off the bat that I see that's interesting here is that to me at least, it seems unusual that the higher frequencies are on the left-hand side of the dial and the lower frequencies are on the right-hand side of the dial. That's sort of backwards of the way most analog radio tuners are as far as I know. Down here we have radio volume. We have intercom, which we have listen and talk. And this is a spring-loaded switch. This is your input selector. So you have radio, intercom, and radio. Intercom, which would be intercom only, and then phono input. Here we have intercom volume. And of course, you've got an auxiliary power outlet here. It says 117 volts AC at 700 watts. I would assume that this is so that if you had a portable record player, you could have a place to plug it in. You'd wheel it over on your record player stand and you could plug it in here. And somewhere there must be an audio jack on this. Oh, well you get the audio jack plate, don't you? Here we go. So here it says phono face with jack. And this is in a little cardboard bag. And as much as I hate to do it, we're gonna cut the staple here. See if we can not rip the bag. 
open this up. Ooh. The bag was made by Advanced. It's a number, it's a one slash two, 100% craft paper. Safety first, it says. Okay. Always watching out for everyone's safety. We have screws, I would guess. And here we have an ivory, it's a Leviton. Look, it's an old school Leviton plate. And it's a jazzy plate because it's got this sort of diamond and dot pattern around the outer edge. When was the last time you saw a, a switch plate that looked like that? And here in the middle, we've got a fairly standard RCA jack. And here, You've got the terminals for the jack, you'd have the signal and the ground, and you could wire this up and hook it up to your twinette. What's really nice about this right off the bat I see is, we've got a bunch of wires here on the top. You can't really see that very well. So let's turn this around. And you can see wall housing here, and the wall housing is completely painted and finished. It's just not, plain steel. It's not just galvanized or something like that. It hasn't got some kind of sort of a commercial industrial paint coat on it. It's got this really nice sort of copper tone finish that's kind of got a pattern to it. I'm not sure what they call this exactly, but it's a nice attention to detail. So the real money, what we really want to see is what does it look like inside? So let's open it up and see. Of course, because it's old school, it's got slotted screws. And it's got really long screws. Check it out. Those are every bit of an inch worth of threads, maybe a little bit longer. And of course, because it's from 1957, they're machine screws. They're not those self-tappers that strip out after a while. We don't want to lose the screws. So where are we going to put them? We're going to put them in a cup that way they won't get lost. I assume that like most things like this, they give you really long screws because you would mount the wall housing during, into the studs during construction. And then, I don't know, 1957, you could have plaster walls, you could have sheetrock walls, drywall, or I've seen some houses from that time that have sheetrock and then, because they were fancy deluxe homes, they would put what was sort of like masonite button board over all the sheetrock and then they would come through and plaster the walls. And that was supposed to be a higher end finish, I assume. The problem with that is the button board adds thickness to the wall. And then all of your door jams and all that kind of stuff have to be custom because the walls are thicker than a two by four with sheetrock on it. So that's kind of a pain. So let's go ahead and lift this out. It looks like we got some plugs. Let's unplug this. I assume it's a plug. It's been in there for like 65 years almost. Wedge it out a little bit. There we go. And another cord over here. You can't really see this. Get this out. There's our wall housing. There's our twinette. So let's look at the wall housing really quick first, because that's fairly simple. It's also painted on the inside. So up here, you've got a socket right there, kind of hard to see, that the plug from the back of the twinette plugs into. And here you have an electrical junction box. It says warning, 110 volts, and it's got a two-prong socket on it. And here we have a label, another home intercom intercommunication system twinette model MS300B by Music and Sound. It's a nicely made wall housing. It's almost completely enclosed. There's a couple holes here in the bottom, which I assume were for screws. If it was sitting on a block in the wall, you've got a hole on each side to screw it to the studs. And in the top, 
You've got a knockout here where your electrical wire would go in to power it. You've got, these are all your for your intercom wires. You've got some vents and a couple of little holes. It looks like this is set up for another electrical socket, but it's not in this, so maybe that was something for a future model. The reason it has vents in the top is this is a vacuum tube model, and vacuum tube models rely on convection cooling. So vacuum tubes generate a fair amount of heat, and of course heat rises, and as the heat rises up out of the set and out of the wall housing through the vents in the top, it has to find a way to pull new replacement air into the wall, and that's how it stays cool. In theory, sometimes that would create problems because sets run hotter than you would think they do, that can affect things. There was a new tone model back in 1957 where the housing was very much like this and there was a, a lack of convection cooling in the design. It would actually get warm enough that it would affect the strength of this magnet in the speaker. So that was a problem. We'll put this over here. Let's look at the back of our twinette. So it looks like it is pretty much all original. You've got a label down here, Music and Sound Incorporated, 118 Leslie Street, Dallas, Texas, and perhaps a serial number of 2537 right here. Don't know how many of these they made. You know, this was still a fairly new idea back in 1957. So, you know, if you had one of these, especially if you had one, I think, that looked like this, you were living the Jetsons lifestyle. This was not something that everybody would have, and this would typically go into sort of a higher end home, I would guess. It's got a total of one, two, three, four, five vacuum tubes. So the radio is most likely based on what is classically referred to as an American five tube radio. It's just AM. And the way you kind of look at these, whether it's music and sound or some other brand like Newtone, these are really, radio built-in radios with a little bit of intercom because five tube am radios are a fairly standard design everybody's got their own individual take on it but they're all five tube radios so it's a five tube am radio that builds into the wall with some modification and some extra wiring and so forth to make it work as an intercom so the intercom is just another audio input into the 5.2 radio design. You've got this fairly jazzy mechanical clock assembly here. And on the motor, it says Sessions. And it looks like it was made in Forestville, Connecticut. So we'll do a more detailed look at some of these things as I go along. Perhaps not in this video, in another video. And one of the things I like about it here, you have a pilot lamp here and a nice red jewel lamp here above the AM radio tuner. I'm sure that's the indicator light that shows that it's actually turned on. Over here on this side, you have your phono input right here. It's an RCA jack in the chassis. And you've got a fairly standard complement of tubes in the set. You have a 12BE6, you have a 12, it's probably a BA6. Down here you have a 12KX7, here you have a 50C5, and here you have a 35W4. So tuner tubes, basically simplified explanation. Radio tuner tubes, rectifier tube, power output tube. Same exact tubes that are used in most American 5 tube radios. Also, same exact tubes that are used in Newton intercoms from the same period. So let's go ahead and take the bottom off a minute and see what we got underneath. So I'm gonna take these little keepers out. It's got a cardboard cover on the bottom of the chassis. It's a fairly simple chassis. And they have these little push keepers, which is interesting to me because these are the same kind of push keepers that are used on Newtone intercoms from the same period. So either it was an industry standard item that everyone used, or they just stole ideas from each other. I don't really know. It's kind of fastened on the front also, so it's gonna be a little hard to see. I think the way this is designed, 
the chassis, I think if you remove the knobs, remove the nuts that hold the knobs to the faceplate, I think you can slide the chassis out of the faceplate. You'd have to unscrew. I think I don't think that is. The clock assembly looks a little complicated. It's kind of interesting here. There's a wire nut with tape on it. The tape's kind of unwrapping because that's what electrical tape does when it gets old. I assume that that's the way it came. Here's our multi-pin plug. We'll get to the bottom in a second. This has a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pins. The center pin with a notch in it is for indexing so you can't plug it in the wrong way. This is a very common kind of connector that was used back in those days. It's basically based on a, a vacuum tube base. So you can use a vacuum tube socket and then you have this and it plugs in and that was just the way things were done in those days. If we look at these switches, the one that's stuck for some reason will take some investigation as to why. Oh, that one actually locked down for a second. See, to me, ah, that one did. To me, it makes more sense that they would lock down to like turn on individual rooms. So this one actually got to lock down. So it may just be that they need to be cleaned somewhat and this one's just stuck in the lockdown position. This is not the kind of thing you want to just impromptu play around with because you might break something. And of course, none of no replacement parts here at all. Nothing at all. Anyway, so underneath, let's prop this up a little bit. If we look underneath. It's a fairly standard American 5.2 chassis assembly. Kind of an interesting design. Here's the back of our power socket. These are, our, these are both volume control assemblies. This is a switch assembly, another switch assembly. And then up in here, there's, see, as you can see, there's not a whole lot to this. These are very simple designs. You have the bottom of your tube sockets. You've got some capacitors here. These are wax capacitors, lots of resistors. You've got your tuning cans, the bottoms of them here and here. And I've done a video about those, how they get the silver mica disease and they get noisy and that's all, all a really pro a real problem. One of the things I like about this design is you've got this metal rod that runs here and here and here. It runs all the way across and then all different legs of components are tied into it. I don't have a schematic or anything for it and I haven't really looked at it in any detail because this is the first time I've seen it also. This is probably a common ground. It's not a hot chassis ground would be my guess. One of the things about old tube radios is oftentimes the chassis the metal part of the radio is the electrical ground of the radio and those are what are referred to as hot chassis and if you develop problems with them it's easy to, for someone to get a shock from it so i don't think they did that here i think it's an isolated chassis and this is probably your common ground so it's a pretty good design uses a lot of standard bakelite carbon composition resistors and some ceramic capacitors and a few other capacitors. Not a lot going on. It's a pretty simple, straightforward design. What would need to be done with this before it would be put into use is the capacitors, there's three of them, they need to be replaced because they're well past their shelf life. There isn't any reason to leave them in there. And also in this kind of design, this is a very generously sized chassis. You got tons of room in here. So easy to replace. The replacement parts for these would be about 1 20th the size. So very, very small by comparison. The other thing that would need to be done is up here on the top, this is a multi-section can capacitor. It contains three capacitors. This one is made by a company called Sangamo. S-A-N-G-A-M-O, never heard of them before. Made in the USA though, it has dry electrolyte and it's an 80, 50, and 20 microfarad at 150 volts DC. The reason this has a cardboard cover, if you were to remove the cardboard cover from this, what you'll find underneath it is an aluminum cover. 
And the reason they did that is the cardboard is an insulator, so it's not touching, it's no, no chance of it touching any other metal parts. This also would need to be replaced because it, again, well past its shelf life. What you would do with this to keep it mostly original, this type of part generally not available anymore. If you could find the values that you need, the size is gonna be wrong. They can't get ones with cardboard covers anymore. It's all just a giant pain in the neck. So what would typically be done is this would be left on the top here so it looks original. And then underneath, you would electrically disconnect it, has wires that are soldered to the bottom of it, and then you would carefully and securely tuck away underneath here the three capacitors that you need to complete the circuit. Again, those modern size capacitors are gonna be very, very small by comparison. Each one of those would be, I don't think I have anything floating around here on the workbench I can hold up and show you, but they would not be very big at all. They would be, you know, maybe a half an inch diameter and maybe three quarters of an inch long. Not difficult to tuck in there, especially because you have a really big chassis. This would definitely need to be updated a little bit before someone put it to use. The other thing you can tell about this system, there are no installation instructions. There is the brochure that talks about it a little bit, but there are no installation instructions so I would assume that you got those when you bought the wire or something. I don't know how they did that in those days. You would think since it's a kit, you would think that you would get everything, but maybe not. So what I'm looking at here, you can sort of deduce how this was meant to be wired. If you look at the wiring harness here, which comes out of the socket that's inside the wall housing, if you look at that and you look at one of the speaker assemblies with the control switch for the remote stations, these have three wires. You've got white, red, and black. And if you look here, you've got six purple wires. You've got a red and a black. And the red and the black are heavier. These are probably about 16 gauge, and the purple ones are probably about 22 gauge. And so six purple wires, six buttons on the master station. So obviously it's a three wire system and each remote station gets wired with three. The red and the black, one of them is a common and I would have to sort of root through the switch to figure out which. I'm gonna guess that the black is probably the common and then black and red are intercom and black and purple are music. So it's a three wire system and you would run three conductor cable between the master and each remote station. The other thing that's interesting about this system, and perhaps that's the difference between a 300 and a 400, is that on the remote stations, there's no volume control. You don't have a volume control of any kind. It is seems to be wired up so it plays music, and perhaps there's different settings for how it plays music. It just says talk and listen. So it could be a spring-loaded switch. Let's take a look and see. Not sure. No, it's not spring-loaded. It's just a rotary switch with two positions. So I assume that you leave it on listen and the music plays through. And then when someone wants to use the intercom, you turn it to talk and then back to listen and talk and back to listen. So it's sort of like your basic walkie-talkie three-wire system where it takes both people to operate the system. Someone's in one room and they move the switch to talk and call to someone and it has to move it back. And then the responding person moves it to talk to respond and then moves it back to listen. So there's a certain amount of coordination involved in getting it to work right. Probably would have been better if it was a spring-loaded switch, but they didn't do that. But no volume control in the remote stations, so I assume that the volume for the radio is all controlled from the master station for the entire house. And perhaps that's the difference between a 300 and a 400. The 400 speakers seem to have an extra knob, which is probably the volume control. So little more money on equipment that way, on parts, but you get more functionality and it differentiates the two systems. Again, you have to go back to the idea that having something like this at all was super rare. So 
those little oddities are part of it. This, which is in, in a plastic bag, seems to be a roll of the remains of some vintage electrical tape. So obviously they wanted you to tape up the connections. And there is a little bag that's torn open. Oh, it's the bag with the nuts and the lock washers, which I assume are what hold the speak or uh, the switch control to the back of the speaker grills. The thing that's not obvious to me is did these, these are the speaker plates, did these have some kind of bracket or box that went in the wall during construction or did these just get screwed into the wall somehow? You cut out a hole for the speaker and then mounted this and screwed it to the wall. Don't really know. I think the speaker actually sits diagonally because that's kind of how the holes line up like that. I don't see screws. Maybe it's in the screw package for that either, but very interesting early music and sound design. Perhaps one of the very first ones that they ever made. So there you have it. A music and sound model MS300B Twinette in copper tone finish. AM radio, room to room intercom, and a super cool clock. Now, what's gonna happen to this? I don't have any idea. I, I don't have any plans for it. Ideally, there's someone in the world who wants this. And there's enough here to put together an entire system. You could have four or five inside stations. You could have four inside and a front door, or you could have three inside and two front and two doors, front door, rear door, or you could do five inside if you wanted to. It is definitely very vintage, very cool. There's a little discoloration here on the grill. It's got some, looks like gold showing through, and then the rest is black. Don't know if this was gold to start with or if it was always black, but that would be easy enough to take care of, needs to be cleaned up, and it needs to be completely serviced. The plastic on the knobs is very crusty. It's got some kind of residue on it just from sitting around forever, probably from humidity or something. But a little bit of cleaning up, it would be like brand new, and it would work really well. See, there's corrosion on the plug pins. So it needs to find a home at some point. While I'll probably do at least one more video about it a little bit, one of the things that you should know if you run across something like this is at this point, being from 1957, which makes it 64 years old, do not take this and just first thing you do is go and plug it in and turn it on because you're just asking for trouble. There's parts in here, there's electronic components, the capacitors primarily that are well beyond their shelf life and you plug it in and something shorts out, gives out, and then there's a big giant cloud of acrid smoke and you stink up the house and you ruin the set and you create a big problem for yourself. So you always have to fight this temptation to plug it in just because of curiosity. It needs to be taken care of and checked out thoroughly and updated before you do something like that. Also all the tubes, which are probably all original, because they look like they do. This one has a code date of 2257. This one, wiggle it out here. These are electronic tube made in the USA, General Electric, 22 of 1957. So these are all original and odds are they're all just fine. Vacuum tubes don't don't deteriorate with age. They only deteriorate with use. So these are probably all fine, but Sense tells you that you wanna check them all out before you do anything with it. But a little bit of work needs to be done on it to clean it all up, clean all the controls, and then you can hook it up to your heart's content and see what you get. So future for the Twinette, not gonna do any real work on it. I'm probably gonna play around with it. There may very well be another video about it. I have to figure out why this switch. Oh, look, it came undone. See, I figured it out without even trying. So right here on the shaft of the switch, which you're not gonna be able to see, there's a little notch. So if you push it in and you push it up, it stays in and if you push it down, it pops back out. So these are obviously, this is a mechanical form of selective call, I think. So if you wanna to talk to room number three, you would push in the button and push it up so it stays in. Then you use the intercom here 
to talk to the person in room three while not bothering the other people, I would guess. And then when you're done, you push it down and it pops back out. How cool is that? So this is very much like what you would see in an old time movie where someone's, where the secretary's in the office and Mr. Drysdale's in his office and he needs to get a hold of somebody in marketing right away because something really important's going on and she pushes down the appropriate button and yells to somebody and they show up, they're all scared they're gonna get fired. Anyway, that's how it was in the 50s, at least in the movies, I don't know. I hope you found this interesting and perhaps for someone it will be helpful. If you're interested in something like this, you can always get a hold of me because I'm not a collector. I'm just interested in old intercoms and it was too good to pass up. Being complete in the box with all the remote stations, there's enough here for someone to do something with it. You know, if it was just some remote speakers or just this and no wall housing, then it's a kind of a problem. But here you have a complete setup. You just need some wire and a few other things to make it all go. And so, you know, it could be put back into a vintage mid-century modern house and it would be super cool. So I hope you found it interesting and maybe for someone it'll be helpful. If it is, give it a thumbs up on YouTube because that helps us just a little bit. There'll be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe. Go to our YouTube homepage, click on the bell, and when you click on the bell, click on it to receive all notifications, and every time we post a new video, you'll get a notification and you can watch it. Also, I'll post pictures and other information if you send them to me about your equipment on the community tab of our YouTube channel. And the community tab is a place where I post pictures. Recently, I had a fellow send me a picture of a Newtone 2400 stereo music intercom system that a friend of his owns, and I post it up there, give you credit for it, talk about it a little bit. It just gets it out there, and it's kind of interesting. So if you've got something, send it to the email address down here, and I'll put it up and give you credit. That's all for today. See you on the next video.